is uh, something that we've done for the past few years. Uh, today's the youth mission trip worship service. Uh, we give thanks uh, in our worship um, for the youth, but also for how the congregation comes together as a community to make this possible. I mean, we're all on this mission trip. It's, it's kind of, oh, that may sound flip, but I really do believe that without the support of the congregation, whether you're posting on the blog or um, supporting financially, um, you're down there. We're all down there uh, working. Some of us just have hammers in our hands. <laughs> Uh, and so what I want to do is a real loose format here. Um, if somebody it, would like to kind of give an overview. Sure. Um, so we worked with a program called Camp Rhino in New Orleans, and as you can see on my shirts. And um, they set up a, us up with another program called the, the St. Bernard Project. And through them, we split our group into three different groups and worked on three different houses. And... Um, then we, well, most of the houses have been worked on for a while, and so people were doing things such as putting in flooring in houses and, like, adding trim to the walls and painting and things like that. So they're kind of in their fin finishing stages. Uh, well, maybe a couple of background bits. Rhino is <coughs> Restoring Hope in New Orleans, and it was started by a pretty big, wealthy church just after the storm. And it's now been focused on youth only. It was much broader than that after the storm, which is now eight years ago. And it's remarkable how much damage and uh, has not been repaired after, the, after Katrina. St. Bernard was started in a parish one over from the main New Orleans county. Parishes in, in, in uh, Louisiana are, are counties. So and St. Bernard had been started after, a bit after the storm, and it was to do home renovation. And a lot of the home renovation was after contractor fraud. So, uh, which was the case in the house of where Ryan and I worked, there was contractor fraud where a contractor collected this woman's insurance proceeds and essentially life savings, did a terrible job for a while and skipped town, which mm -hmm. was very, very common. Mm -hmm in New Orleans after the storm. So that's what the St. Bernard Project does. And actually, from starting out with just a, a handful of volunteers in a little warehouse in, uh, in St. Bernard, it is now pretty big. And actually, they've been involved in Sandy Relief as well in New Jersey. The areas where we were working, it looked, it, it was really devastated. I mean, it, there was, most of the lots were vacant. A new house. Vacant lot, vacant lot, vacant lot, new house, vacant lot, vacant lot, vacant lot, vacant lot, you know, and, and the vacant lots would have a, a front stoop on it or something and a bunch of overgrown weeds. So they might be well mown and well tended, but there's nothing there. Um, but the place where our church was, if you would have just gotten plopped down in the middle of that area, I mean, I, you would have thought like, like it was like 30 years ago and like the town hit the jackpot and like everything was super nice and so. And, you know, I, I sold someone, it looked like Summit for like a like 15 by 15 block little area. But then you'd go to the other part of town and there'd be like two houses on a block. So. We stayed in, in Tulane, in dorms in Tulane. Um, and the church was, I mean, within walking distance from. Well, actually, we had a lot of free time when we went on this trip just because of like how our work schedule was set up. Like we actually woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get to work at like 6.30. So we had like an early morning um, work schedule, which gave us a ton of time in the afternoon to just kind of relax. And sometimes we would, you know, get together and talk about what we worked on and all that kind of stuff. So and then Camp Rhino also had an evening program every night where we would kind of, it was like probably less than an hour of a worship service or singing. One night they, uh, we went on something called a prayer tour where um, Lee had Lee had been, uh, Lee and Tom had been in New Orleans before, and so they took us on a little bit of a tour. Um, but then also uh, Rhino took us on a tour where they showed us um, not only the devastation, but also the sort of continuing inequality and disparity between the haves and have-nots. There was a really interesting 
Um, we, we went by two schools, one that was a public school and one that was a private school. And I mean, it, you know, it could have been South Africa. I mean, it was just like, it, uh, the difference was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and she took us through, uh, you know, a bunch of the areas where, okay, so here's where the levees broke, um, here's where it came through, uh, here's where the water rose to, um, and, you know, you just, you, it's impossible to believe what happened to a city in the span of three days. Why don't you describe the homeowner business? I mean, let's see, so our homeowner visit, let's see, her name was Miss Carmelita, and let's see, I think she came around noon Thursday. Brought some food? Uh, yeah, she brought the best food ever. <laughs> she can cook. It's, it was very good food, and then she told us stories. And yeah, like, they were deep stories. I mean, she pretty much, like, as what, like what we learned when we read in the packet, they gave us, like, a short, like, informational brief, I guess. But she, like, enhanced everything. Well, she owned uh, a soul food restaurant, like, just down the block from where she lived, and all her family lived. I mean, it took, like, a minute for her to, like, explain where all her family lived in that, like, same, like, two-block radius or something like that. And um, what she said is, is originally when, when the storm came, people thought it ended, and so they came back and, like, looked at everything, and then the levee broke. Ooh. So a lot of people got trapped in there, and she said it was, you know, 20 to 25 feet of water. And so some people just drown with their entire families in, in their mm -hmm. homes. Um, but they thought it was safe to come back and then and it all came. I was um, where my homeowner's name was Miss Gwen and she was saying how the water rose to her roof. So she was first thing with her and her husband and her son were trapped in the attic and it is hot in New Orleans. Like we got that from just being there for a week. <laughs> but they were stuck in the attic and then they had to get out onto the roof. And so then they were stuck on the roof for three days in the heat just on the roof, like no shelter or anything. And then they had to go swim to their neighbor's house to get two little girls and a mom and a grandma out of there. They were trapped in the roof too. And so then all this group of people were just stuck on the roof. And helicopters would come and they could take one or two people so by the, I think she said she got rescued after four days of being stuck on the roof. Her son, and they took the, like, the grandma and the lady and her kids, but when they came and they were like, we can only take one more person, she made them take her son because he couldn't swim and he was just deathly afraid, even though they wanted to take her. So she made them take him, and so then she and her husband swam to the airport where a bunch of people were going. And they just kind of slept on the ground for one night because all the planes were filled. Uh, she moved to Galveston, I think, and then another hurricane destroyed her new home. And then she came back to build her home in New Orleans, but then uh, contractor fraud took away most of her money, so uh, she couldn't afford to renovate her house and like get flooring and everything installed in, so that's kind of what we were there to do. This uh, Presbyterian church that we, that where Rhino is based, um, they made a very conscious decision after the storm that they would be essentially become a one-issue church mm -hmm. to a single issue of rebuilding New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what did you learn, what, what, what have you spotted that has changed the way you look at your world, even here in the Twin Cities? Um, well, when we went on this, uh, this spirit tour, um, after we we drove around most of the city, and uh, Avery was her name, right? Mm -hmm. She pointed out that there were no grocery stores. And in the, we drove around the poor neighborhood for, I don't know, it was probably like 45 minutes, and we saw no grocery stores. All we saw was corner stores. And so, I kind of thought about it that I live in a place where there's, I mean, five grocery stores within walking distance, and um, and to think that they have no place to get to get good nutritious food that all there is is the junk food at the corner store. I mean, that was the thing that probably hit me the most is that they don't have availability to fresh to fresh nutritious mm -hmm. good food. Yeah, that was something that I noticed too. They explained it a lot, and that was just. 
it was impossible to even imagine going through that. And so that's one thing that Rhino, one of their programs, is other groups that come down there have the option to work at, um, do you know what the garden's called? Mm. Well, they work at like a community garden where they're like harvesting vegetables and different good nutritious foods and then so some people have more access to those kinds of foods. We, we have been on trips where they've talked a lot about advocacy um, and we've had a very intellectual understanding of, of what's going on but as I look at our kids that have graduated and gone on to AmeriCorps or go on to other activities um, what they're doing with all of us that go down there, adults and the kids, is hoping that we'll take what we've seen and the stories we've heard and come back and A, let people know there's still a need down there. Um, that we don't just flip from cause of the moment to cause of the moment. We look at what's the larger issue here, what's missing uh, in our society think about how hard it was. We sure it was hard because it was hot and we got sweaty and we were like, you know, in our house, um, there was like, I mean they had fans, but for a lot of it we had to close the windows because we were doing um, texturing on the walls and um, which is basically when you spray like, um, I forget what it's called, but you spray like something on the walls to make it like kind of have that bumpy feel. And so we had to close the windows and like put plastic over them. And so when you went into like the upstairs room especially, it was so hot. And so that was kind of the, like the only thing I really thought of when we were doing the work is like, you know, this is really fun, but I'm really hot. So I think it kind of made us, you know, wonder how much other people had done and made us think about, you know, how hard it is to do this. And we're only there for a week. I was, I was struck by how much the kids learned doing that. But I mean, you know, but it's, Kids showed up and they've never really worked with hand tools before, you know. And you're going in, and you're gonna you're gonna floor this room, or you're gonna put trim on all these walls, or it's like you know they don't know the first thing about it, and they all left knowing how to do that stuff. So. The the frustration of the quality of the materials that that, that presented. Yeah. We weren't we weren't working with floorboards flown in from where good floorboards would come from. <laughs> and so, what was one of the what was one of the issues that we dealt with on a daily basis? Well. Okay, so basically just quick background on the room we were doing. So the group that had been there the week before us had put in all the floorboards and it was all done and we walked in and we were like, wow, this is a cool floor. And the lady was like, yeah, but it's half an inch too short. So your guys' job, because we can't put down half inch floorboards, is to pry up every single one of these without damaging them and put them back in. And the thing is, is these boards were so fragile that, like, the slightest mistake with any of them would just, like, tear just the tiniest little bit off. And if it's damaged at all, it's completely useless. Um, I kind of had a different experience. Maggie and I were working on this hallway, and it was, like, a small hallway, so we thought we could do it in a day or two. But we ended up taking it all up, like, two or three times, so I was getting, like, really frustrated. I was like, there's so much to do in New Orleans and we're working on a hallway. And so I kind of struggled with that the week, but then like even when Miss Wen came and she saw the hallway that we done in the hallway upstairs and she would like cry because she was so happy that it made it worth it. <laughs> Something that amazed me was we had um, each of the houses had supervisors from the St. Bernard Project and they had been working on their houses from start to finish. Um, and our supervisor's name is Emily, and we weren't the best at like doing everything because we'd never done it before. And she had to teach us everything that she knew, and she hadn't actually done any housework before she had started with the St. Bernard Project. So it was um, really interesting how much she had learned. But she was so patient, even when we would get things wrong, she'd be like, oh, it's okay, we'll just start from the beginning and like do it again. Even though the house had to be done within like the next month. And it got finished. They sent us pictures of the finished houses, which was really cool. But it amazed me how patient she was and how dedicated she was to her house. The first for us, we, we always invite friends um, to come along. But this year we had two exchange students. What was that like for you guys? 
I mean, it was good. I mean, it was just another hand, so it was nice to have someone else there. But it's not like we really, like, once we were working, you know, it wasn't like, oh, you're not from the United States. It was just like, you're part of this group, and we're happy that you're here. So. Well, I got to say, uh, working with Clem uh, and Danny in town was cool. But Clem actually a lot of times was like, guys, come on, get up, we have to keep working, and like the rest of us would be sitting around for a minute, like, um, resting. <laughs> <laughs> and so he actually kind of supervised a lot of the work in our room, so he was pretty cool. Yeah. Is that one of the foreign students? Yes, oh. he was from France. Like you said in France, like, I mean, they saw, like, they saw it on the news back then, mm -hmm. but like, I think USA, we get things done fast, so that they think it'd be over like pretty much right after that. Yeah. But then when he goes there, he's just like, wow, there's like tons of work to be done. And we never hear about this in France. I really have come to appreciate these, these mission trips because and I said every year, and I'm not using hyperbole or lying, this is a hardworking crew. Mm -hmm. The first year I came to work with y'all, um, I came from a church where mission trips were a little bit more fun. <laughs> and it just busted my chops, you know, because the, the youth want to work. Uh, they don't like a lot of downtime. Uh, and, and that has persisted as generations have gone on. They will probably attest to this. It's just, you know, it's give us something to do. I think it's interesting to reflect on the word hope. You know, Rhino means restoring hope in New Orleans doesn't mean restoring the housing necessarily. It's not restoring housing in New Orleans, it's restoring hope. What were some of the lighthearted moments that helped kind of balance the heaviness of the experience? What were <coughs> the funny moments, the funny moments? Um, We got to use Tulane's like, rec center, and so we got to go out and play basketball <laughs> and every night. And, or not every night, but we played a few times, and that was always like a good bonding experience and kind of like let us um, not have to think as much and like not be as immersed in all of the um, devastation. So yeah. It wasn't as much basketball as it was, much, as it was just <laughs> wrestling over the yeah. ball <laughs> in the water. There was like eight people at the game. It was awesome. All the powers just piled so mm -hmm. high. <laughs> but you just had so much left over on the plate. And then I figured out that it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I had never seen a cockroach before. <laughs> I would like to say thank you to all of you, um, to all of the church. I would like to say thank you to the youth for your inspiration uh, and, and really just this reminder of how much this is our work that we do together, even if you are not actually on the trip. I think it's a, a real important lesson for us to learn. It's more than cutting a check. Uh, it's more than uh, posting on a blog. It's restoring hope in the people who go down because the kids really feed off the blog comments and knowing that the prayers are there and then they have the energy to do the work. So thank you everybody.